Welcome to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com, dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. Serving leaders, managers, and people who will be, helping you reach excellence in your work and achieve your personal goals at the same time. Sign up for the free course at clearandopen.com. Even when I'm completely right, contractually, he's disputing some billing thing. His perspective goes completely against the written and signed contract. So I'm totally right. But I still have this feeling, right? So you see, it doesn't matter when you hold someone accountable, whether you're right or not. If they disagree, you're in conflict. And that doesn't feel good. Hi, it's Joseph. And thanks for tuning in to Manage to Engage, the podcast from clearandopen.com. When we think of courage, we often think of braving some sort of life-threatening situation. But almost every day, even people who jump out of planes avoid holding others accountable or being held accountable because it might cause emotional discomfort. If you really want to be courageous, try intentionally confronting and amplifying your emotional discomfort. Now that's difficult, but it's also a requirement to begin navigating shame with the accountability path one of Clear and Open's most powerful tools. I offer weekly member webcasts, online courses, and mentorship at clearandopen.com because it's my truth that with the right tools, anyone can eliminate the people, money, and time problems holding them back in business. And I share parts of these webcasts and courses on this show because I want to help you too. If you're enjoying the show and learning from it, I'd really love your feedback. If you're listening to the show on an Apple device, all you have to do is open the podcast app, view the full description of the episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review for the show. Thanks so much for listening. Let's start the show. So I wanted to start uh, just by sharing a little bit about where I'm at in the moment, just to sort of clear it, but also because it's relevant to you guys and the subject of accountability. Uh, I'm in the, in the midst of a... Uh, I'm in the midst of losing a client who is uh, very much not suited for my work. Uh, and that's uh, something occasionally someone in my position has to deal with. And it's a, it's a funny position to be uh, in a situation where the conflict that is arising is precisely because the person is a bad listener and can't hear that they're a bad listener. <laughs> That's the bad listener paradox. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, have you ever heard a conversation that kind of went like this? Uh, I don't think you uh, are, are listening to me very well. Oh, I'm listening to you just fine. <laughs> no, you're not qualified to comment on how good a listener you are because you're talking, not listening. <laughs> I once said this to my mother I said it, the, it was a, a conversation I was moved to have with, have with both of my parents because I was just sort of struck with their own mortality and they've been sorting out their estate and whatnot. And I just kind of realized like, there's some things I want to say to them that I need to say before they die. And like, it just feels like now's the time to do it. This is it. And I said to them, I said, you know, there's a really deep way in which I've never felt listened to by either of you. And my mother immediately said, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, this is like a Seinfeld episode, right? You can imagine George in talking to his mother. That's not true. No. Thus, of course, I look to my father as the voice of reason in the moment there. Like, will you? I know you're, you've got a logical head on your shoulders. Can it, can it show up in this moment? But alas, it did not. So... Uh, so what I wanted to say about this was um, I'm just feeling the churning and shaky, all the stuff you feel when you're in a conflict. It's really interesting how the, the emotional and physical feelings are um, pretty much identical to what it feels like when you're uh, about to possibly get into a fist fight. You know, it's the exact same thing. It's this shaky, scared, fight or flight kind of adrenaline, just sick. You just want it to go away. It doesn't feel good at all. And I was just a couple of minutes before we started here, I was thinking, oh yeah, this is a great reason to avoid accountability, right? Because sometimes when you hold people accountable, it will create conflict. And this is what the result is. 
And it sucks. It's really not fun, right? Even when I'm completely right, contractually, he's disputing some, you know, some billing thing that it goes completely, his per- perspective goes completely against the written and signed contract. So I'm totally right. But I still have this feeling, right? So you see, it doesn't matter when you hold someone accountable whether you're right or not. If they disagree, you're in conflict and that doesn't feel good. When does that feel good? Right? It never feels good. So, you know, part of our brain says, okay, there's some accountability, some confrontation, some something that has to happen here, I can choose to engage with it, but it might produce this very icky feeling for days and I'll lose sleep and all that. Or I could just avoid it and not feel that. Right? That's, I think, what's going on unconsciously all the time. And it's totally reasonable. And to add on to this, I'm I'm talking to them later today. And the old pattern in me would be to make a case for my reality, which happens to be right. And any judge would agree. I mean, it's just black and white. But that I could feel how making the case in that way would be a way of making this icky feeling go away. Because for me, the icky feeling is rooted in, I did something wrong because they're not listening. And guess where I learned that from? mom and dad, right? So anytime any adult isn't listening to me, some inner child in me is like, oh no, they're not listening. It must be my fault because that's what happens to us as children. So instead of making my case and and shoving it down his throat, how right I am, which wouldn't be very good as I've learned here and there in my life, I'm going to try to take the high... I am going to take the high road. And I'm not going to make my case unless they're, if they ask, which is unlikely to happen. I'm just going to say, okay, I hear your perspective. I see it differently, but how would you like to make this right? And I've already decided things I'm willing to do that are quite generous and things I'm not willing to do. And I think it will go just fine. But the price I'm going to pay is I'm going to have to feel that icky feeling for longer, probably days, because churning in me is this like, ah... I did something wrong and I have to show them that that's not true, which is a parent projection. I have to show because they're making me feel wrong, sort of in quotation marks, because that's not strictly speaking true. They're stimulating the shame I'm not listening to. There's something wrong with me feeling. And so to make that feeling go away, I have to show them that they're wrong and I'm right. Which, while logistically true, isn't prudent, practical, or in this case, emotionally healthy. What's emotionally healthy that I'm prescribing for myself is bearing the feeling and taking the high road to prove to my shadow that I'm not in my parents' house anymore and they're not listening to me doesn't affect me. Not like my parents not listening to me. That did, right? That made a scar. These people not listen to me? What's the problem? You go through life, people don't listen to you every day. What's the expectation? Everyone's supposed to listen to you? For this part of me, he's like, yeah. And if they don't, I'll make them. Well, that's a recipe for suffering. So I'm going to head that off at the pass. So that's what I'm dealing with today. And I, I thought that might be interesting to you because it's really relevant to the accountability conversation because when when you're holding someone accountable or being held accountable it's you're inviting all sorts of emotional difficulty to deal with this is precisely why we don't want to deal with it it's just messy and it doesn't feel good i mean it feels like having the flu you know i woke up in the middle of the night three times arguing with this guy in my head okay calm down you know working through it again and again and again this it's not fun And the easy route would have been, I actually wrote an email that made my case. And thank God, in the last minute, I didn't send it. Wiser dynamics prevailed. And I was like, okay, don't don't email this kind of stuff. Believe me, I made that mistake so many times. So yeah, so um, I thought I'd throw that out there just as a a way of templating for you and, and giving you an example of 
of just how complex it is. And if all of this sounds like really intense, deep psychological psychodynamics, well, you know, I mean, like I'm a trained therapist in a lot of ways and I've been doing deep internal work for 15 years. So it may not look like that for you, dot, 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 yet. But trust me, all that stuff's going on. If all you're feeling is just the kind of nausea and ickiness of it, all there's a reason for all that. There's all sorts of stuff underneath it and it can be, can be worked with. So uh, comments, reactions, questions about any of that and or digestions from the assignment that I gave you last week. I know you guys had some fun. That was, that's very good feeling stuff, right? But that can be scary too. I journaled this morning and when I was journaling, I was talking about yesterday I had a sales call and I hadn't, hadn't had a sales call in a while. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying my best to follow the script that I've been given to, to use to do that. Mm-hmm. And I'm making progress. But in the course of my writing, I discovered that one of the things I did during that sales call yesterday was dead wrong to do, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'm in sales training at the same time. So sending that call is an important part of me learning and getting feedback from other people. And there was a part of me that wanted to tell them that there was something wrong with the recording. (laughs) So I wasn't going to be able to send it. And at the same time, I was like, I need to just live in this embarrassment Mm. of knowing and send it anyway. And that was way different for me. And one of the things you just said that really hit home was make that feeling go away. Yeah. And so that's my share for today. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. That's courage. That's courage. And when we think about courage, we think of, you know, climbing mountains and, you know, fighting battles or whatever. That's courage. The courage to turn toward and intentionally amplify emotional discomfort. Because look at the unknowns there. You don't know if that's going to get you in any kind of trouble, if there's going to be consequences, right? They could throttle your leads back as a result of that. That could have a real serious impact. Sure. And you're, and you're saying, no, I'm going to push myself into this discomfort. And, and I love that you use the word embarrassment because the uh, social science from a uh, courtesy of Brene Brown shows that embarrassment, when you are with it and own it, actually creates learning. It's Mm -hmm. not a bad thing. We don't enjoy the feeling of it, but it's productive. Mm -hmm. So you're pushing yourself into the embarrassment of like, oh man, I did this wrong. But And then you notice the desire to hide it. And that's where a lot of people will get really stuck because they'll be embarrassed that they had the desire to hide it. Right. And then that creates a shame spiral like, oh, I shouldn't have that thought. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the primary causes of racist behavior. Because uh, in, in our culture, uh, and surely many others, you know, it's well accepted in most circles that racism is bad. And let's define racism, at racism here as uh, actions based in racism, not just the thoughts, right? So people have the racist thought and they go, oh no, I'm not supposed to have that thought. Well, I better pretend it's not there. Don't tell anyone you had that thought. Push it down. But more often than not, if you don't accept that it's there and look at it, that's actually what causes the racist behavior. It's like putting your thumb over a garden hose. You can't really stop it. It just causes it to to squirt. So as I say very often on this subject, I'm from an all-white town in Massachusetts. I have racist thoughts every day. And I don't like that they're there, but I'm not trying to make them go away. I use them as information like, whoa. There's like a radio station, uh, a racist radio station in my head. You better be careful that that doesn't translate into action. I mean, you know, we've got thousands and thousands of years of really intense racism in our world. It's not going to change overnight. It's definitely not going to change overnight if we pretend that that's not there, (laughs) you know? So I really think that, you know, you see people get caught in racist actions, you know, in the public sphere and on TV and whatnot. And when people deny their racism, I think that they actually believe 80% of the time 
they really think they're not racist. Because the amount of shame that would come up if they actually were to look at what was in them, they just can't bear it. And so it's the same kind of thing, having a kind of a shame resilience and an emotional fortitude to go, whoa, this is in me, you know, uh, the desire to steal something. You know, I was just yesterday, um, I was uh, having some of my furniture worked on up some uh, some uh, stools that needed to have their backs reinforced and i found this really cool uh teak piece that was square it was like almost like a domino but made out of teak and, and finished for some reason they must have carved it off or something and uh i was embarrassed about asking to have it it was just a wood scrap right i'm sure the guy didn't need it and i felt myself like it was vulnerable to ask because like could i have this i think this is cool like that felt vulnerable so I was like, well, just steal it. Just put it in your pocket. He's not going to miss it. I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I went back and forth like half a dozen times. Because, precisely because I didn't want to endure the vulnerability of, I think this is cool. And like what he might think, I'm, if that's just a wood scrap. You're an idiot. Like he might think that or something. And that would affront my self image. So I was going back and forth like that. I, I did not steal it. But I didn't have the guts to ask for it either. <laughs> It was a tough day in some ways, but I, but I didn't steal it. It would have been very easy to do. And those are the moments of courage. Thanks for listening to Manage to Engage, the clear and open podcast. Join us next week when you'll be a little bit closer to who you're destined to be. Until then, know that clear and open is dedicated to the evolution of you because businesses grow when people do. If you want to help the show grow, I'd appreciate you leaving a rating and review on iTunes. All you have to do is open the Apple Podcasts app, view the full description of the episode, and click the link to leave a rating and review. Or you can go to clearandopen.com slash review, and it will bring you to the right place. If you're looking for more support on your journey, head over to clearandopen.com for even more tools, articles, and free resources. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now.